Welcome everybody to the Geoscience Australia Wednesday seminar for the 21st of September. And this seminar is a good one because it's a distinguished Geoscience Australia lecture uh, seminar. Before we get, oh, my name's Andrew Heap and I'm the Chief of the Minerals, Energy and Groundwater Division here at Geoscience Australia and I'll be chairing this seminar for you. Uh, before we get started, I'd just like to acknowledge that uh, Geoscience Australia acknowledges the traditional owners of the custodians of the country uh, throughout Australia on which we're meeting today, which in Canberra, where we are here today, is the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people. And we acknowledge their continuing connection to land, waters and community. And we pay our respects to the people, the cultures and the elders past and present. So as I said today, the Geologic Geoscience Australia's seminar is a distinguished Geoscience Australia lecturer or a DGAL, as we like to call it, which demonstrates outstanding contributions to the objectives of Geoscience Australia and Geoscience in general. And we're in for a bit of a treat today because we have a tag team uh, uh, set of presenters. Uh, and this morning they are uh, Adrian Hitchman, Wenping Zhang, uh, Jingming Duan, and Darren Kai. And they will be presenting Mapping Ge Electrical Conductivity Structure for the Geological Interpretation and Mineral Prospectivity. Geoscience Australia's Magneto Tellurics program. <clears throat> Just a little bit about the program uh, and the and the presentation before I introduce our presenters today. So the Magneto Tellurics or MT method maps the electrical conductivity and resistivity structure of the subsurface, which provides crucial information for mineral exploration. Geoscience Australia has actively applied the method to provide multi-scale, world-leading data sets to improve the understanding of the geology and resource potential across the country. We demonstrate the value of scaled MT data acquisition, starting from mapping large scale conductivity structures in the, sub, in the lithosphere, utilizing long period MT data sets, through to the resolution of finer scale structures in the crust for camp scale targeting. Integration of data from multi-scale surveys provides an effective way to narrow the search space and to identify targets of mineral potential in covered terrains. Our work has helped to increase explorers' investment and confidence for new mineral discoveries in greenfield regions, including for critical minerals. So, a little bit about our presenters today. Uh, we have Dr. Adrian Hitchman, who joined Geoscience Australia for the second time in 2004, uh, before joining the Magneto Tellurics program. He was part of the Geoscience Australia's geomagnetism and minerals advice teams, and he has previously investigated Earth's electrical structure using geomagnetic data alone and is still getting to grips with what it means to be able to use the telluric data as well. Then we have uh, Mr. Jingming Duan, who is a senior geophysicist at Geoscience Australia. He has worked on a range of projects in the application of multidisciplinary data sets for mapping geological structure and resource potential. He has extensive experience in applying the magneto tellurics method for Earth's crust and mantle studies. And then we have Wenping Zhang, who joined Geoscience Australia in 2012, and she has applied a diverse skill set to a range of min programs in minerals, groundwater and community safety programs. Since 2016, she has worked in the Magneto Tellurics team with a focus on data modelling and interpretation to improve the understanding of geology and mineral potential. And then we have Mr Darren Kai, who holds a Bachelor of Science degree from Macquarie University and he has been focusing on the planning, acquisition and processing stages of Geoscience Australia's Magneto Tellurics programs since joining the team in 2017. So, please join me in welcoming the team to the podium. I think Adrian's first. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew, and a good morning, everyone. Magneto tellurics emerged as a geophysical technique in the 1950s. Today, Wen Ping Jing Ming and I will give you a brief tour of some MT basics, its contribution to Geoscience Australia's scientific programs, and its impact in collaboration with our national partners on improving our understanding of Australia's geology. As we do, we note that our fourth presenter, Darren Kai, is in fact uh, in North Queensland as we speak, deploying empty equipment and won't be able to join us today. With Andrew, we also acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands on which our work is undertaken and pay our respects to elders past and present. We extend that respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people 
who join us today. My presentation today will include a short overview of the MT method and some considerations for survey planning. And then Jingming will discuss some of the work and results of the OSLAMP program. And Wenping will describe some of our recent work on regional infill surveys. Our planet is surrounded by a magnetic field. It helps to protect us from the solar wind and many species use it for navigation. This magnetic field is undergoing continuous change. Long period or low frequency changes can have periods of a few seconds, minutes or hours and are caused by the impact of the solar wind on our magnetic field. Very short period or high frequency changes of less than a second are caused by lightning generated by thunderstorms. These magnetic field changes cause electric currents to flow in all sorts of things that are good conductors of electricity, including satellite circuits, electrical power lines, pipelines, and importantly for today's seminar, rocks. MT measures at the Earth's surface these natural time variations as shown in the plots below of the magnetic field. Sorry, I've gone backwards. Of the magnetic field, these three sections here, uh, the so-called magneto part of, MT, of magnetotelurics, uh, and of the electric fields that the changing magnetic fields induce. Um, these time series show typical uh, variations recorded at an MT site over a four to five week period. So there's something like 40 days worth of, of data shown there. The graph on this slide shows high resistivity values to the right and high conductivity values to the left. As you can see, the electrical conductivity of geological materials varies by many orders of magnitude. It is affected by factors such as rock composition, fluid content, degree of weathering and temperature. Normally, cold and dry rocks have high resistivity. For example, in the top right, you see that igneous rocks such as granite are highly resistive. However, in mineralized regions, massive sulfides and graphite are far more conductive, amongst the most conductive geological materials we know. Sedimentary rocks tend to have mid-range in conductivity, with clays and shales being more conductive than sandstones and limestones. Salt water, as you might guess, is also very conductive. These strong variations in conductivity are useful for mineral, geothermal and hydrocarbon exploration, as well as groundwater detection and monitoring. The footprint of a mineral system is potentially detectable at a variety of scales, from the deposit scale to the entire lithosphere. MT is one of a few techniques that can provide multi-scale data sets to understand the larger mineral system. Geoscience Australia requires three types of MT data. The first, very high frequency audio MT data, which targets structures in the upper few kilometres of the crust, which can be used to characterise cover. High frequency broadband data that can be used to map crustal architecture. And long period MT data that can image Earth's lithosphere to a depth of a few hundred kilometres. Like many of Geoscience Australia's programs, the planning of an MT survey is multifaceted and calls on the skills and expertise of colleagues well beyond the MT team. We rely on them for their invaluable assistance with things like input into survey area selection, land access and cultural heritage clearances, tender and contract management, and survey logistics. Without them, it would not be possible to run an effective MT program. A typical empty station will have three magnetic field sensors, 
shown in red in this diagram. Here, here, and here. They are oriented north-south, east-west, and vertically. They are usually buried to give them some stability and protect them from wind vibrations and temperature variations. The top image shows one of the horizontal sensors. At 1.4 metres long, these induction coils are not too difficult to deploy horizontally, but a bit more of a challenge to deploy vertically. Four electrodes are also buried in north-south, east-west pairs. Shown as black dots in the image, they make an electrical connection with the earth and measure the induced, magnet, uh, the induced electric fields. The magnetic, and elect the magnetic sensors and electrodes are connected by cable to this data recording unit in the center, which is powered by a battery. This type of installation shown in the diagram is for audio and broadband MT acquisition. This equipment will typically deployed, be deployed for about 24 hours at each site. The setup is similar for long period acquisition, except that the three smaller magnetic flux gate sensors are all housed in a single plastic cylinder about the size of a large jar, as shown in the image on the bottom left. A long period installation would typically run for four to six weeks so also includes a solar panel to recharge the battery and cables are usually buried to protect them from inquisitive animals. MT data processing is a multi-step process. This example shows a month long period of magnetic and electric field data. It is first pre-processed to inspect the data and re remove anything that is poor quality. For example, the neighbouring farmer ploughed the paddock next door and the magnetic field measurements were disturbed for a day. Or dingoes chewed an electrode cable and the last two weeks of data are missing. This good clean data is then Fourier transformed. <coughs> this is a mathematical process that calculates the amplitudes of the various frequencies present in the time series. In this step, the data is transformed from being time dependent to being frequency dependent. And this frequency dependent data is then processed using both commercial and open source software to calculate the Z transfer functions, shown up here, that relate the magnetic field components H to the electric field components E. These transfer functions may then be released as process data and or used for further analysis and processing, as is shown in this image here. Okay, with that brief introduction, I'm going to hand over to Jing Ming, who will uh, tell us a bit more about our long period M Auslan program. Thanks, Jing Ming. Oh, thanks, Adrian. Uh, I'm going to talk about how we use the OSLAM data to narrow the searching space. As many of you know already, OSLAM's program started nine years ago. So far, we've completed about a full, nearly half half this side. Uh, here you can see GS contribution for this program. But why we doing OSLAM program? I want to give you a little bit of explain. As we know, the traditional way to exploration we basic on the outcrop, outcrop geology. So, but 80% of Australia is covered by sedimentary basin. There is no outcrop at all. But uh, what is our approach? Auslam is the way we can really image the entire list We We can use this bottom-up approach to search in this potential area. So first, I have a quick look at the Auslam in southeast Australia. So this left the image is a graphite anomaly. 
the red images of slime plot on top of a magnetic anomaly. As we can see, there is quite a nice correlation between the Oslam feature, the model, and the, the receptivity structure, and the, the magnetic anomaly, and the gravity anomaly. For example, here is the uh, Kalamana province, and the Dalamara orange Kalamana province show quite conductive. The Dalamara orange show quite resistive. We also can see this in gravity. This show quite nice correlation. And the same we see the same correlation in other area too. So also think about we look at other um, geophysic data, like the left side is the seismic tomography. So we, we also see similarity. This uh, in the Kalamana province that also, the receptive structure show this area is quite conducted. And that the wave speed, suspend wave speed is slow. In the receptive area, like the Dalmar orange, that's quite resist. We show the wave speed is much fast. So we see this is the different geophysical scene. They the give us similar pattern or similar feature that that we how we give it this better chance to integrate the data then upload this all the cop and the gold deposit on top of this uh, resistive structure at the crust and the mantle depths we can see quite a nice correlation special correlation between the conductivity anomaly and the gold copper deposit. Majority gold copper deposit is seen above the conductivity anomaly or at the gradient of the conductivity contrast. Uh, can we see this in other places, in other regions? This is in southeast south region. So let's move to North Australia. Uh, the black box basically in, indicate where we study area. Uh, the left top image is the really 3D model uh, with resistivity model we derive from this Oslam data. Uh, the, and the, the bottom two slides is the, uh, derived from the 3D resistivity. We can see quite a lot of features. Some area quite resist, some area quite conduct. Uh, I should say this is quite deep, down to 300 kilometers in depth. So, if we plot at the 2D slides, at the mantle depths and at the cross depths, we can see quite an interesting feature. Uh, some area very resistant, some area quite conductor. Uh, this is give us uh, extra information for tectonic evolution. I also plotted like this. Uh, you see this dash line is LIB with the Crow and the other colleagues work together. They published this already. So, for example, we see in the East Tenant region, this is about a 30 kilometer offset between this LIB. So, in the north, the more much deep than the east. This contrast indicates some quite quite favorable controlling structure. We can see this from a mantle all down to this in the crust. This is the left image so we plotted this uh, gravity anomaly. The right is the mental uh, resistivity structure. Uh, we, we, we know this is the, at these depths, we still can see some correlation between this gravity anomaly and this uh, LIB and also this resistivity structure contrast. 
for example, we see this feature in the in this big public is when big is gravity anomaly in the wall. So we can see this follow this velar suture nicely. We see this resistive structure in here and the here's conductive structure, resistivity structure. We see this contrast in between. Uh, this feature is quite marked in the resistivity structure too. Uh, if we come to the shallow, to the middle crust, we see this uh, magnetic anomaly. They have a quite a nice correlation with the, this resistivity structure too. We can see this uh, is along this velar suture zone, uh, we see some in this this area, LRM province, and we see in this uh, Musgrave area. Uh, also in the Monte Esa area, we see it's this big, big resistive structure in the Monte Esa area, we see this mag magnetic anomaly. So this is all the different geophysics signature tell a similar uh, story. So let's come to the geology. We know the uh, Tanama region or Tanama Creek region or Morphe province, the older in the uh, older age is around that 18, 18, 1800 million years old. So in this area, the old crop indicated the rock in that area is around 1800 ma. Where is bigger tectonic event occurred in that area? So if we move to the, look at the source, this source area is relative, it's younger than the uh, north, then similar events the East Mount Asa. So if we come to the resistivity structure, we see the Tanama uh, province is significant conduct. And this conductive anomaly along the velar suture zone all come to around the near uh, Alice Pern. So we also see similar structure in the tenet, east tenant. This is a significant conductive anomaly at the cross steps that come move to the east, the east beneath the Mount Asa, this is a significant resistive structure. But this resistive structure we know is KLB, but the divide both this western foldable and the east foldable. The east foldable is significant conductivity anomaly. We know this is a capital conductivity anomaly. This has been mapped by several studies. Uh, this conductivity probably had a kind of oceanic subduction. Let's have a look at the mean occurrence in this area. If we plot the left side, is we plot this gold and the copper on the receptive structure, we can see in the Mount Asa region to, ten, uh, to Kankai region, the same, there are a lot of deposited for gold cob. And the same in the Tanaman, Tanaman region, there is have a uh, original gold deposit in there. If we look at the right image, this is nickel and zinc and some rare earth. They are not really sit above the conductive anomaly, but they are in, in the sit above the gradient of the resistive contrast. We also see this, there's some rare earth follow this area, the Velaris. So this is all that give us a quite a exciting tool to see where we should look this. So then we come to the crust. We plot this again, the copper gold on the left side and the, the raw earth and the nickel and the other in the, in the right side image. We see this correlation nicely again. So the 
either the seed above the conductive anomaly or seed under the gradient of the resistive. So why why we see so many mineral deposits in the Mount Essar region? I'll try to give a little bit of explanation here. So basically we extract the top slice is extracted from this red line in the right side across this uh, this we can see this depth last to uh, to around down to 300 kilometer depths if we see the time uh, in the time uh, mine sit above this crust conduct and also we see a lot of other origin go sit above this conductive normally so we think the origin go really form in the middle to low crust and they have a significant link with the uh, middle to low crust or uh, middle to low crust conductivity anomaly. If we look at the Mount Asa region, so we see it's quite a significant conductive anomaly in the mantle. I think we really map in the mantle somatized mantle. This mantle somatized is a primary source for the mineral. So this come up through this flu pathway with the, through this weak zone, then trap on in the bit in the Mount Asa to Kankari region. If we come to the look at this cartoon, let's give some explanation. So we can see similar approach they use even for different uh, mineral system. So from the discuss so far, where we look potential area. So the left side image is is the as a 50 ohm SO surface. What it means is very conduct. We look really look this conductive anomaly. We have a conductive anomaly or have a significant contrast. The is really linked from deep mantle from mantle or from low crust that all come to the surface. That's a, that's the area we are looking for. So we search in this area. If this source really come from mantle and have significant conducting, more likely we will find some area that have a general deposit like the Mount Asa region, Kankari region. So what I do is just the select the few areas, only basic geophysical MT point of view. So we look at this area, like area one in the mountain. So this have we know already a lot really uh, mineral depositing in that area. We see this already. Then we we think from a tandem along this Velarus suture zone is another potential area. So it's tenant. We already doing a lot of study in this area, and we see this already. So. Uh, some drilling results also confirm some discover. Uh, I think that there is a false potential is in the warm pain province that must grab warm pain province. That's another area we can look. That's only from MT point of view. So I want to move to it's currently this is the one I want to work on for the national conductive map. So this nation conductive map, even for this very rough mode, because we have a lot, miss a lot of data. We have an acquiring WA and this in some part of the country. Even with this very rough model, if we plot the cross the boundary from Russell Koch and McDougley, and we compare with the tectonic mapping map, we see the uh, some interesting feature already. For example, we see this conductive anomaly in here. We know it's in this region or 
So we see this conductivity anomaly in Mount Isa we know very well already. We see in the east uh, Gola Karaton. Uh, so we see in the Bendigan Bendic region, we, we see this feature already. The, the same also have a quite nice correlation with this interpret uh, the major crust boundary. This though, I think this conductive view give contribution for geologic interpretation. Uh, so if we move to link to the mineral perspective, we plot the, all the gold and coal on top of this map. Oh, for this, even this cause resistivity structure, we already see some interesting feature. We see the here have a a lot of gold in the Montaesa area we already talked about in the East Gold Carton, uh, in the Bendigan area, even in this uh, Ilgon. We see this all the different interest features already. So f how we can translate this conductive structure into geologic architecture and the geodynamic area. also we can discover or found the potential area. If we doing this national conductive, we really image the root of the mineral system. So far, we observe a strong special correlation between this frag conduct and IOCG deposit, the potential for other type deposit. So we want to turn into this resistivity structure really become a predictive analysis tool. So, which can help us really identify the source, the character, the favor controlling structure, and also help us to identify the flu pathway or potential the zone for travel and the preservation mineral. From our discuss, we already know there is significant correlation between cross conduct and origin and gold deposit. So. Hope that we have, can do more study in the future to find the more interesting things. So this is or just try to say we start from the large scale survey, doing scale reduction survey, then doing pre-drilling and finally drilling. So I will leave this to Wenping to continue to discover detail. Thank you. Thank you, Jimmy. <clears throat> so, uh, from about two decades ago, we have worked with states and uh, Northern Territory, uh, Territory Geological Surveys to collect empty data along seismic lines and across prospective um, mineral and energy regions. For example, uh, in Mount Isa, uh, Mount Isa province in Queensland, um, Gola Kraton in South Australia and Yuga Kraton in Western Australia. Some exciting results have been published. For example, results from a transect in Olympic Dam, in Olympic Dam region. And this data set from phase tensor analysis showed the MT response, uh, response indicate a 2D structure approximately 2D structure. Uh, therefore, 2D modeling approach, approach was applied to this data set. Uh, we look at the model section on the left. The model revealed a number of conductive pathways extending from the deep source to the near surface, remarkably aligned with known IOCG deposit including the world-class uranium IOCG Olympic Dam deposit. And these conductive uh, uh, pathways also coincide with the narrow zone of low seismic reflectivity. So they, we, um, the, the author from South Australia interpreted this pathway, um, interpreted these conductive pathways as fluid pathway for transporting mineralized fluid from deep source 
to the near surface. Now we move to um, Mount Isa province. In collaboration with GSQ, from 2007 to 2014, we have collected MT data along a number of seismic lines. When we look at the data, phase tensor showed actually 3D structure for longer period. Therefore, we applied 3D modeling approach to, um, to this profile data. This is the first time we do this practice. And uh, the, the data, um, th this approach actually can achieve more realistic result. And the model result here showed this uh, vertical extracted, vertical section extracted from 3D model actually characterized a west deep, west deeping conductive zone. And the in the surface coincides with Gidea uh, Sutra zone. We interpreted this as a, as a subduction zone formed during major uh, tectonic events. And this deep penetrating structure often act as fluid pathways for mineralized fluid coming from the deeper source to the upper crust to form deposit. And in 2016, we undertook a high resolution um, MT survey with 476 sites. And 3D model showed um, a more pronounced conductive along GD suture zone. And also two conductors aligned with the known IOCG deposit, Ernest Henry and Mount Margaret mines. And they come from deep source through fluid pathway. So more recently, with much improved coverage of all lamp data, we could use 3D OSLAMP model to identify um, prospective region to undertake skill deduction infield MT surveys. For example, we have done um, East Tenant survey uh, in, the, uh, in Northern Territory. And the two surveys are happening right now in Dalimarin region. Uh, one is undertaken by University of Adelaide, that's the Kanamana Cube survey. And we extended the survey, the coverage, further to southeast. That's our Kanamana Cube extension survey. Also covers our drilling program interested area. Um, I'm going to show some results from its tenant infill survey. On the left is the OSLAMP model, a depth slice at 35 kilometers um, at, is at the lower crust. And we identified a conductive feature to the east of Tennant Creek, and also along the corridor characterized by a number of faults interpreted from seismic and potential field data. So we planned, um, we, uh, planned 132 sites, including some proposed drilling sites. We collected the audio MT and broadband MT data. So we used the 3D model to characterize the you know, crustal structure. This 3D model showed, excuse me, this one. The 3D model revealed two prominent conductors in the mid and the lower crust. And more importantly, the conductor extends to the near surface through conductive pathway. One at the surface coincides with a legacy borehole DDH005. And here we show the conductors 
with conduct with resistivity of less than 100 ohm meters. So the two major conductors interconnected in depth with multiple uh, conductive pathways extending to the near surface. This structure is similar to the structural control observed in Olympic Dam and Mount Isa region. Also, the legacy drill core showed schist with pervasive uh, hematite and uh, magnetite alteration, and also minor copper with hematite, which is very encouraging. Then we go in, uh, we move into the near surface for drilling program. So as part of the pre-drilling geophysics program, we used high frequency audio empty data to estimate cover thickness for drilling targeting. And this time we used the probabilistic modeling approach. It's the code developed by Ross Brody in Geoscience Australia. It's, uh, it's built within a basin uh, framework. It's a transdimensional, obviously reverse jump Markov chain Monte Carlo code. And uh, using this um, approach, we sample millions of models. And the model parameterization is driven by data and prior information. And uh, we also adopted the minimum structure philosophy. And we could use multiple micro chain in parallel to sample millions of models. So here shows the result is the posterior probability distribution derived from millions of models. And in the middle, the middle panel shows resistivity over depths from millions of models. That's not one model. And we can see um, that from the model layer uh, change point histogram, we could pick the transition where most of models transit from conductive to resistive basement. For example, this spike at about 200 meters, that's where we picked the top of basement. And in from basin uh, approach, we could also quantify the uncertainty of our estimates. We use the full width half maximum of the spike as uh, to quantify our um, estimate is in meters. So now we show some results at proposed drill size. For example, the first one we interpreted the depth to basement is at about 70 meters. That's the transition from conductive sedi sedimentary basin to resistive basement. The second one about 250. And the fourth one was about 800 meters. That's probably too deep to drill. And the last one is the most interesting one. It shows conductive material started from the near surface and extends to deep as, as deep as 2000 meters. So this site was drilled, uh, was drilled as DHI BK4. And in December 2020, um, together in collaboration with Minix CRC, we completed a 10 hole 4000 meter drilling program. Here on the left shows some drill results. The left first one is from NDI BK4. It's the one we just showed, the interesting one. Then it shows uh, NDI BK4 contains mineralized uh, sulfides sulfide mineralization and also elevated concentrations of several um, economically significant elements, including copper, gold, lead, and zinc. There's also other <laughs> results from the 10 drill borehole. The data are released publicly now. We also use the drill result 
to um, validate our MT model and help to improve geophysical interpretation. For example, as ET10N, we, <laughs> we estimate estimated the depth to basement is at about 200 meters. And the drill result showed actually the top 40 meters basement are weathered basement rocks. Weathered basement rocks could be as conductive as sedimentary basin rocks. So now we could see why there's discrepancy between our estimate and the, and the actual um, top of basement. So in fact, our estimate picked the fresh basement, the resistive basement top. Um, also, we produced the cover thickness map. And this map helped with geo targeting and also helped with characterization of covered sedimentary basin, which is South Nicholson Basin beneath Georgina Basin. And from this map, we see a basement high at the NDI BK6, and also a localized area with actually infilled younger sedimentary rocks. Um, around NDI BK10. And to the northwest of Galongra Fort, the cover thickness is much greater than to the southeast. That's, because, uh, that's indicate the presence of the South Nicholson Basin. And we interpret um, the fort, uh, Galongra Fort, um, the South Nicholson Basin is bounded by um, Galongra Fault. So we have released a large number of data sets and model reports. We also um, published our results um, as journal papers, conference papers, and exploring for the future extended abstracts. They are all publicly accessible. Well, I live here. I invite Adrian to do the summary. As we move toward the close of the presentation, I, I hope you take away a message that MT is a, an effective tool for multi-scale mapping of uh, many regions, including those with deep cover. Uh, it's able to map lithospheric architectures, crustal features and fluid pathways, as well as fertile sources, and can quickly narrow the search space to identify possible distal footprints of mineral systems through integration, especially copper and gold related mineral systems, for example, IOCGs and orogenic gold. Um, I'd like to finish by uh, acknowledging our many partners and collaborators. Much of the work presented here has been in collaboration with our state and territory partners, academic and industry collaborators. We would like to acknowledge their contributions in terms of providing uh, funding and resources. And we also acknowledge the contributions of traditional owners and landholders within the survey areas. Without their support, GA's MT program would be much diminished. And thank you very much for your interest in MT today. I hope we've been able to show you a little bit um, of GA's uh, current program, uh, how much it's evolved since uh, MT first emerged in the 1950s, and what a great work our technical experts, in particular Jingming, Wenping, and Darren, who's unable to join us, are doing in this program. Thank you for your interest. Thank you, Adrian and uh, Qingming and uh, Wenping. That was a fantastic expose of the usefulness of MT data to help uh, narrow that search space down. Um, we've got time for some questions. And also, oh, I remiss me to say congratulations on your DGAL as well. Uh, so well done to that too.